the theme is to talk about scale. And when I started thinking about scale, the in initial thing is um, to think about uh, some of the larger things that, um, that we've done. Uh, but scale kind of cuts across lots of different uh, uh, parts of my, my sort of work. So I'm going to talk about three uh, built projects and then within that bring in some other projects which are thinking about scale in slightly different ways. Um, I'm a builder uh, and so I look at things from the builder's side, not from the client side or the design side. I stand somewhere in... In, in that mix of people. And, um, and I I've, I've wear various different hats. William's got a nice one, but I've got this. This one is me as a consultant doing, um, doing jobs with clients and designers and, and other builders. And then this is me as a, running a, a charity, which is called Earth Building UK and Ireland, which does everything to do with uh, earth structures and earth finishes. So although my particular thing is round earth, which is uh, you'll see a form of building where you're using a formwork, which is the shape of the wall, and that it's filled in layers of loose soil, which are then compacted, and then another layer, which is then compacted, and another one, until you take the form away. But there are lots of different types of um, uh, structures. And one thing about scale that we've just been thinking about uh, recently is um, that Cobb is uh, uh, quite a well-known um, earth structural type and we've just started thinking about mapping it. So this is Cobb at scale. This is 8,000 Cobb buildings which have been bought and sold um, in the southwest of England um, in the last 12 years. So th there's, a, there's a lot of it and, and this is uh, the listed buildings, there's another 5,000 uh, buildings there. So this is, a, this is kind of a market which exists and it's, it's out there and it's quite big. And it's something that we have to try to uh, get people to understand that a high percentage of these buildings are more than 100 years old and that it doesn't wash away in the rain. Um, but, um, so I'm just going to go, I'm going to go back and then, <clears throat> oh, now this is interesting. Um, so the first of the three projects that I'm going to show is um, uh, is Pines Calyx, a build that we did. So the three projects I'm showing are all in the 400 to 500 ton um, sort of field, which is big for us. And um, so Pines Calyx was a building near uh, near Dover, and it's all ram chalk, which is I'm showing that first because we are in Brighton. Um, and it's all curved, and um, the, the, you know, the first thing that people want to think about you know, if, if you try and bring something that they haven't thought about before is cost. And one of the things to say quite immediately about this job is that the, is that the walls, the chalk walls, um, cost the same as the light fittings. And, and so the thing about cost and where cost lies within a within a structure may not be um, uh, totally obvious. And we, we often get what's called um, value engineered out because they say, oh, well, that's, that's more expensive than uh, a line of concrete blocks. But they don't say, but it's the same cost as the light fittings. So these are just funny things. So then I'm, I'm sort of doing a bit of a time travel here. This is, this is how projects at scale start, where you sit down with the design team. Now, this, this was taken 10 years after the building was finished. So I'm cheating a little bit because I didn't take a picture of the design team uh, when we started, which I probably should have done. Um, this is a, a review meeting on the building 10 years later. And this uh, arrow here is to the most important person uh, uh, on the team, as far as I'm concerned, because he's the one that's brought me more work than anybody else. And he is not the engineer and he is not the architect. He is the surveyor. He is the money. And when the money gets it and understands that um, uh, you can put an earth wall there and the money is there and it will justify itself, everybody else relaxes and you can just get on with the job. So um, this is where once you've sat down with the design team and 
the surveyor knows that the engineer is happy and the engineer knows that the architect's happy and the architect knows that the surveyor is happy, then um, you can go on and think about practically what you're doing. And practically what you start with as a design team sort of standing there on the site when it's just, just started to, to be dug and, and, um, and thought about, you go out and you take this picture, and I've got masses of these pictures of the site before we've touched it, and you just don't know how much of your life is going to get drawn into this pit. Um, and it's, uh, it's something you always have to kind of try and remember to enjoy this process as you go along because it's going to take a lot out of you. And if you can start to enjoy it straight away, then uh, the whole thing becomes easier. Um, so that, this, is a, this is a chalk bank and which is going to get dug into. And we've taken some of this chalk... Uh, that's been dug out and um, made it into samples and then they're crushed and various things. Uh, in this case, it's set into the side of the hill and so they're using a, a proprietary product to keep it dry and we're testing how that proprietary product sticks to chalk, which is a very um, soft material uh, um, in terms of its strength and also its surface condition. So we're playing around with things, researching as we're going along, um, and then we come on site uh, once the main contractor has prepared the site and they've put a, they've put a slab down. We, um, you can see that there's a fraction of chalk and there's a fraction of soil. This fraction of soil is over here on the right and underneath the covers there um, is the chalk itself. And um, so one aspect of scale is thinking about having a workforce that can do these things. So this is uh, from a, a European training standard that we wrote, uh, were part of the team that was writing it. And this is unit M, which is from raw material uh, to mix. And so in this case, we're taking the soil, all of the wall build, building material comes from the hole that we've dug on site. And some of the stuff that we have to think about is uh, in the knowledge and skills area is about uh, not contaminating the material that we're using, not mixing up that top fraction of soil which has organic material with that lower fraction which is just chalk. And, um, and so I'm at that point, uh, level three and level four at the European Qualifications Framework means that I'm working autonomously. I know what I'm doing and I can tell other people how to do things. But I'm doing this particular job before any of this has been written. So I've given myself permission to be level four. And then later on, we've come along and said, what does that actually mean? And codified it. Because um, while I've been happy to just get on and do this stuff since my early 20s, a lot of people uh, aren't. And it's difficult for people without qualifications to go and use these kinds of materials because they're not codified. So it's been part of the way of thinking about scale is to think about training. So this is our job. This is using a, a commercial uh, system formwork, which we're putting into curved uh, sections, which they're not really designed to do. Um, and then we're lining those forms with, uh, with ply to make it smooth on the inside face but as a series of facets on the outside face, which take that waterproofing system and then some insulation so that it's not, the building doesn't lose heat into the, uh, into the side of the hill. And then this is basically what we do. This is a, this is a kind of motorised uh, wheelbarrow, and um, it's bringing uh, material which is then uh, laid in um, loose, and then it's compacted, in this case, mechanically with a, a, a pneumatic tamper. And we just do that all day long. You just put in another layer, ram it down, another layer. And as long as you can make the box the shape that you want the wall, um, then you're good to go. So this is a first uh, piece of wall out of the box. This has taken us a day to build. And um, it self-stands on the same day. And um, it's very thermally massive. means that you don't shade the windows. You don't stop sunlight coming in. You don't... Uh, worry about the air temperature inside the building becoming uncomfortable because all of the excess heat will go into that wall. And when the sun goes down, 
you feel comfort of that wall um, storing its heat. Quite. Um, um, and then you just, you, you just in, in sort of building terms, you just have to be well organised. And then you can take something that you've dug out of a hole and turn it into structures. But you have to um, think about the weather, you have to think about covering up, and you uncover every day so that the wall can lose moisture. And then at the, every night, it doesn't matter what the weather's doing, you just bring the covers back down again. Um, and then uh, this is the first floor slab coming in. And so we've covered with a lighter plastic, which actually will trap underneath the, the concrete slab. And that's kind of my insurance because I'm second on site. First on site is groundwork, second on site is walls. And um, we, we, we need to know that our walls are protected while the job goes on. And in this case, the roof wasn't put on for another year and a half. And so we were quite pleased that we'd had that protection in place. Um, just little decorative things using naturally found flints that are just laid into the face of the wall. And then 10 years later, we come back and um, talk about how it's going. So this is kind of arc of the, of the whole process, which was, which was um, you don't get with, with every job. Um, it's got a big uh, gouache de vino uh, dome on top that it's taking the load of. It's very nice technology. Um, so that's the first one, and that's using material that is um, taken uh, all from site. Um, the next one is... Um, uh, is a job where it's a mix of material from site and not from site. This is an office development. So these are buildings at scale in that there's quite a high tonnage of material in it and, um, and that they're all planned in a particular... So I, I, I started out working in, uh, in Africa and, um, and I have a particular sort of sensibility, but when I came back to the UK... I thought, OK, I'm going to go now into the, into the belly of the beast. I'm going to find out how these things work and how I can get in there and work in places where people would say, that's not, you can't do that with earth walls. So this is an office development in the northeast of, uh, of England, and it has this big atrium wall inside a, a timber and uh, an insulation um, uh, outer shell. And um, we're using... Uh, equipment which um, which the contractor has. We're not trying to build costs. We're trying to re reduce costs. And we've taken sand, which is what the site had, um, and added and brought in a percentage of clay. And that's what sticks every, That's what sticks our work together. And clay's got a very interesting mineralogy that it um, it can control humidity in a space extremely effectively, more effectively than anything else, actually. And um, and it can also take uh, volatile organic compounds, VOCs, it can actually sequester, it can take them out of the air and, and store them up. So it's quite, quite interesting for these very tightly sealed um, housing uh, uh, projects that we've been seeing here today, where um, then, then you bring in a, a beautifully toxic sofa uh, to your beautiful straw bale, and then you're kind of stuck indoors with it, and it's kind of killing you. So, but then if you... If you clay plaster your straw bale, then now the clay is actually helping you uh, um, uh, regain that quality of, of indoor environment. Um, and again, it's, this is uh, commercial stuff. We're working with a contractor who's never used it before, uh, an architect that's never used it before, an engineer that's never used it before, a surveyor that's never used it before. Um, and this is being done where I'm now standing uh, not at level four, but actually at level five or six, where I'm actually separate to the job. I've gone on site to train people, uh, and this is unit B, about building. Um, and so it's about um, thinking about sourcing materials and products and uh, machinery and working with the contractor so that we're uh, using what they have to the, to the best um, uh, advantage. 
um, but not actually being on site to do it. And, um, and so we're taking standard bits of industry kit and kind of repurposing them in one way or another. It's just a basic scissor lift and we've built a little box on top and um, that's taking the labor and the material um, uh, and, the, and the equipment up to height. Um, and then it gets taken down again. And, and all of these, these um, training standards, they've now become part of the NVQ system. And that's work that we've done with that hat on called Earth Building UK and Ireland, is that we've, as a, a trade body, an industry body, brought that into the NVQ system so that you can actually train and, uh, uh, and get a qualification to do this stuff. So this is, um, you know, this, this is something that uh, if, if this were just a timber and insulation building that, you, that people would worry about, even in the northeast of England, they would worry about so much solar gain. You've got to keep that sun out because it's, well, otherwise the temperature is going to rise in here and it's going to be really uncomfortable and then you'll need a big air conditioning unit. But uh, our air conditioning unit is called a big earth wall and it just sucks up all that extra heat. It's a funny thing about this particular build that it's uh, a commercial development which uh, became empty three years, if the contract on it ran out three years after the financial crash. And they were very worried that they wouldn't be able to, to release it. And they, within six months, it was fully released. And he said he suddenly realised it's the only earth and timber office block in the northeast of England. And it's very desirable. People like it. They actually like to live there. Uh, you know, you, you, you live a lot of your life at work, right? Um, so, and then the, the, the final um, uh, job that I'm going to show is, um, um, is this one, which is um, the Centre for Alternative Technology. And um, so the first job that I showed you is completely dug up on site. The second job that I showed you is 70% dug up on site. And this job... All of the material has been brought in from uh, a quarry, and that's driven by the uh, specification by the architect. So it, I don't have control over that. Um, but again, it's a, a, a big piece of earth which is using um, solar gain to manage the amount of heat and cool that's, that you have to manufacture. And... Um, uh, it, to, to, to get to the point of being able to do these kinds of scales of job, then you've also got to think about the training standards, which I've talked about a little bit, and you have to talk, also think about um, uh, guidelines. So this is a guideline that we wrote uh, sometime in the early 2000s, and which has since when grown its own... Um, uh, it's grown its own life, really. It's not a national standard, um, but it does have um, quite sort of tight things for engineers to look at, like the, the Young's modulus and, and these things, which I don't really understand, but they do, and it makes them feel calmer. And so to start using these types of materials at scale, you have to think, what are the things that engineers and architects and surveyors, what are the things that they need to know that will make them feel calmer and make them feel that they can accept these funny materials they don't know anything about, that they were never taught about at college, how they could bring them at scale to, in this case, three projects which are all big public buildings, but equally how they might think about um, a social housing situation. How would you bring these materials into a social housing situation that wouldn't put them at risk of their insurance policy and, and, and all of these kinds of things? Um, so the guideline has now become part of, uh, it now has a bream rating, so rammed earth and chalk, it's, all, it's kind of all A+. Plus. It's not a national standard, it's an energy standard, but again it's part of the continuing story of getting materials into the main mix. Because there, really there hasn't been much uh, innovation in construction materials really for the last 100 years. They invented cement, they realised that you could use it with steel, and that's basically been it for about 100 years. And, and those guys have, since when developed all of these standards, training standards, product standards, codes of practice, and so we're playing a massive game of catch-up. 
And one of those catch-up games is that uh, we've brought the material into the national building specification. And you think, this sounds really dry, this guy now, you know. But actually, we can go on site now and the architect might have looked at the specification and then called up the contractor and said, you know you've got to have a little bit of money to test the material as part of the contract. Now, that's absolutely standard stuff for, con- for concrete, okay. But then if I come on site as the as the specialist consultant and say you need to put money uh, uh, for material testing. You say, oh, oh, yeah, earth, yeah, special testing, money, yeah. But once it goes into the specification and the architect says you need to put money aside for the, spec- for the testing, everyone goes, oh, right, it's in the specification. Oh, that's fine. It's just like these funny little uh, um, psychological kind of games that, that, uh, that has to happen. So this is a material, this is a job where it's all come out of a quarry. This is a limestone with clay banding in it. This is a valueless material. It has no value because um, the plus minus 1% clay in this material means that um, it has no value to concrete or tarmac producers. And it will only have value when you've washed out and you can prove that it's less than 1% clay. And so, um, and so they love us because we come along and say, can you add a little bit more clay in? Which, by the way, is just a big heap of rubbish on the, on the site. Um, and, you're then, and then you're then turning um, this waste material into, uh, into walls. And these are, these are guys with skills on site. They've never done an earth wall before. They're concrete uh, carpenters putting together big chunks of formwork. Um, and in this case, they're doing it for earth. And there's just some slight little changes about this than if it was concrete. So we're filling 1.2 metres of wall uh, with soil before we put the next lot of formwork on top. Whereas with concrete, you'd be, you'd be stacking the whole lot up and pouring it as a single uh, piece. So it's just slight changes like that. And then you've got all the normal health and safety stuff. Um, but again, this psychology business, so that big digger on the site uh, f- then filled up these, um, these bags, these bulk bags. And so the material came on site in a bag and everyone relaxes because it's like it's come in a bag, so it must be an engineered material. <laughs> and, and these are all the little sort of games that you're having to sort of think about and play with to, to get people to just... to, to re- sort of lower their guard a little bit and accept that, uh, you know, clay and and sand and stones can be uh, a structural medium. Um, And um, so this is is seven metres of of wall and it's gone together in that formwork at about 10% moisture content and the formwork's all in place until you take it away. And then you're left with a wall which is seven metres high where the bottom of the wall is taking all of the load of the rest of the wall still wet. And so then you're making calculations and you're using the engineer to make calculations to say, what is the wet strength of that material? As it dries, it gets stronger. But what is the wet strength? Is there enough strength in there? And um, it turns out with this material that it's crushing at 0.5. It doesn't really matter what 0.5 is, but it's a 0.5, and it'll grow in strength to 2.5 as it dries. Um, I live in a, in a two-up, two-down uh, lime and brick house, and uh, we put a room on top of the house, and I said to the, um, to the engineer... Um, what's the assumed strength of the party walls that's going to hold up this extra room on top? And he said 0.3. So the thing about strengths is that if you buy a brick, it's probably going to be crushing at 7, and then they'll say, oh, it's got to be crushing at 7, but this is crushing at 2.5, and my house at home, the walls are crushing at 0.3. So all of these numbers, they don't really mean very much until you start to contextualise them. And there's a whole industry out there producing materials which they don't really have to contextualise. They just say, you've got to meet this totally arbitrary figure. Um, And so thinking about then more at scale, oh, I'm running out of time, uh, more about scale is also about marketing. And so uh, eBuckeye is part of an industry, is is an industry body, and it has um, stuff online that 
can inform you about how to do things and it works with European partners to develop different standards. We're working on a trainer for a trainer trainer uh, standard at the moment. Um, and all of this stuff is downloadable uh, from the website. All of the standards, they're all out there to be downloaded. And um, there's a UNESCO chair. And all of these things kind of reduce people's blood uh, pressure a little bit. And, um, and then we, we also, you know, privately have our own uh, marketing that's going on. And so uh, if you want to know a little bit more, then um, please take a look at that. And otherwise... Uh, uh, just be in touch and thank you for listening. <laughs>